Okay, next up is Josh Coleman. <laughs> After his son Otto's devastating vaccine injury, Joshua Coleman naturally took to the fight against mandatory vaccination. As a filmmaker, Joshua's activism has since married with his craft. In 2016, he joined the Vax documentary bus tour, capturing over 700 stories of vaccine injury from across the country. He has since kept the pressure on those responsible for pushing these mandates, namely Senator Richard Pan. <laughs> with his own brand of journalism. He also continues with projects that seek to expose the lies and corruption surrounding the vaccine industry and to educate the public on the very real harm that vaccines can cause. All right. Hi, everybody. <laughs> what a great crowd. And this is my son, Otto, and this is my son, Fenton. When Otto was born, we had him vaccinated as our pediatrician recommended and per the CDC childhood schedule. After a round of vaccines at 17 months old, Otto quickly began to lose muscle control of his legs and ended up with flaccid paralysis from the waist down. The diagnosis was transverse myelitis. Immediately following the, his MRI, where he was diagnosed with transverse myelitis, the doctor asked me, has he been sick? I said, no. Has he been recently vaccinated? I said, yes. That's when I first found out that a vaccine could cause something like that. Otto's pediatrician never mentioned this potential risk of vaccinating. In fact, his pediatrician told me that he himself had to look up what transverse myelitis even was. Had he read the inserts to the vaccines that he had administered, he would have seen transverse myelitis listed as a potential adverse reaction. I live here in the Sacramento area. I found the top specialists that work with transverse myelitis, and they're located on the East Coast at Johns Hopkins Hospital. I spent months there with Otto, where he was tested extensively, and it was determined that his transverse myelitis was indeed caused by vaccination. The doctors all told me how rare it is for someone to have a bad reaction to vaccines. They would say, it's one in a million. It's one in four million. They assured me that it was extremely rare. I stopped vaccinating Otto. I was terrified to continue. He had already, by the age of 17 months old, received 37 vaccines. I was vaccinated as both a child and an adult and got nowhere near that many. Now, Fenton, who was born less than four months after Otto suffered his injury, we told the doctors we were going to wait on vaccinating him. They wanted to vaccinate him the day he was born. We told them no. Over and over again, we said no. Finally, at two months old, we decided to allow his pediatrician to give him a round of vaccines. The doctor gave him five shots containing a total of seven different vaccines. Fenton was a very laughy, nonstop, full of energy baby. After those five shots, he became very lethargic, no smiles, no energy. He would just lay around completely dazed and distant. Fenton, being too young to communicate, he wouldn't have been able to tell us if he was losing muscle control or if his legs felt any different. So we watched him around the clock, petrified the same thing might happen to him. And fortunately it didn't. But after Otto's injury and seeing that change in Fenton, we weren't taking any more chances. Neither of these boys would ever be vaccinated again. It felt like playing Russian roulette with their lives, and I couldn't do that. When they both went into school, they were admitted with personal belief exemption. In 2015, Senator Pan authored SB 277, which aimed to eliminate that exemption. I fought hard against it. A lot of you fought hard against it. By that point, I knew from a personal experience that there was a real risk when it came to vaccinating, and to take that choice from a parent was wrong. As is ethical with any med medical procedure, we've had the right to opt out of vaccination. Now that I was a parent, I was faced with the reality of having that option to protect my children taken away. 
And ultimately, as you know, that right was taken away. But we still had the right to a medical exemption. And this was something that was discussed extensively during the hearings for SB 277. Senator Pan assured legislators at those meetings that any licensed physician in the state of California could grant a medical exemption at their discretion and without restriction, stating specifically that it would be left to their professional judgment and that there was no list that they could exempt for. And now just a few years later, Senator Pan is back with a new bill, SB 276. This bill severely restricts the last exemption we have in California. The bill requires both a physician and surgeon to examine the child, submit a medical exemption request. This request would then require the state public health officer or designee to review the request and either approve or deny it based solely on the adherence to the very limited CDC list of contraindications. That means medical decisions for my children would ultimately be made by someone who has never met them. Now, why do some people end up with transverse myelitis from vaccinations? It's unknown. We don't know. There have been no studies to identify a susceptibility to this kind of injury. And little to no effort is made to identify and protect those who are more likely to suffer adverse reactions to vaccines in general. With the implementation of the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986, which granted economic immunity to vaccine manufacturers for injuries and deaths caused by their vaccines, Congress charged the Secretary of HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, with the explicit responsibility to assure vaccine safety. Since that time, HHS has had the responsibility to make sure and assure improvements in licensing, manufacturing, research, safety, and efficacy testing of vaccines. Along with this was a requirement to submit reports to Congress detailing these improvements every two years. It was recently discovered that HHS has never filed even one of these reports, ever. The Institute of Medicine has known that transverse myelitis was a potential adverse reaction to vaccines since 1994. There are over 1,400 new cases of transverse myelitis every year. Where's the research to determine who might be more susceptible to getting transverse myelitis from a vaccine? The HHS isn't ordering these studies. The vaccine manufacturers aren't researching it. And the CDC, the agency that SB 276 would defer to in determining whether my child even qualifies for a medical exemption, isn't researching it either. Furthermore, how can we even trust the validity of science conducted by the CDC, from whom many of the studies done from between 2002 and 2009 were deemed unreliable by the Institute of Medicine? The number of injuries and deaths from vaccines reported to the VAERS every year are alarming. These are estimated to only reflect 1% of the adverse reactions that actually occur. At what point do we decide that protecting an individual from harm from a vaccine is just as important as protecting against an infectious disease? In all likelihood, a genetic variant predisposed Otto to injury from vaccines. Notice how I didn't say genetic defect. There is no defect in my son's genes. My son was born perfect and healthy. The defect, the shortcoming, the imperfection comes from the vaccine, their flawed science and the lack of safety studies. If this bill passes, the CDC guidelines would only qualify Otto for an exemption to one of the vaccines on the entire required schedule. And per the CDC guidelines, Fenton would qualify for none. Studies aside, common sense tells you Fenton is at a higher risk for a life-altering reaction. 
And yet there are zero studies to assure us that wouldn't happen. In order for my children to attend school, I would then be forced to take the same risk with Fenton that left his brother permanently disabled. And I would be forced to risk further injury to Otto. The vaccine program put my first child in a wheelchair and now the vaccine program is going to kick both of my children out of school. This bill interferes with the doctor patient relationship, overriding what needs to be an individualized determination of what is safest for the patient. Approving medical exemptions solely by a narrow list of contraindications compiled by an agency that has failed to conduct proper research and safety studies is a clear violation of medical ethics and will undoubtedly put many children in danger. <laughs> Families with children whose medical conditions, genetics, past reactions, or health history raise a legitimate concern with vaccination will be forced to play Russian roulette if this bill passes. Not everyone can homeschool and not everyone can move. I ask the legislators voting on this bill, how is this fair? How is this not discriminatory? And how is this ethical? Since SB 277, the overall number of children with exemptions in California has decreased. While the number of medical exemptions has risen, it's negligible. If the overall health of our children is the aim, then we cannot neglect the susceptible few. Thank you.